comes on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Uh, the third thing is the divorce issue, um, which happens, you know, unfortunately it happens. You know, you've got kids that you love to give things to, except you're not crazy about the spouse. And you know they're not getting along very well. And you know, if once, once, it's, once it's your daughter's asset, it's your daughter's asset. It's like the creditor's issue. You know, if somebody goes into divorce court then, and people are adding up who's got what, um, that could end up being in play. So there are some reasons why you may not want to do those giving ups. Um, the other option, uh, which is one of the options that you could that you could do as a gift, would be a revocable trust. Now, the problem with a revocable trust, in, in, a, in a revocable trust, and, and I often recommend that clients consider doing revocable trust as an estate planning tool, and we've talked about that before. If you want to avoid having your assets upon your death have to go through probate, one way to do that is to take those same assets, your house, bank accounts, create a trust, name yourself as the trustee, say in the trust you're totally in control of that trust for as long as you were alive, but specify upon, that upon your death, one of your kids gets named as the substitute trustee, and they have the right immediately upon your death to distribute all the assets. Well, upon your death, because any of the assets that were in trust do not go into your estate for probate purposes, and therefore are not subject to any of the probate rules. Because, because it, 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 but in the meantime, during your lifetime, you've kept complete control of them. Unfortunately, um, because you've kept complete control of them, um, assets that are in that kind of trust are also subject to that five-year look-back rule. Because as far as mass health is concerned, if the assets are in a revocable trust, you still have them. And therefore, you still have the ability to spend them on the nursing home. And if you do, that's what they want you to do before they qualify for mass health. Um, so the final option, which is the option which a lot of you have talked about, um, and which I've done with a lot of clients, is to create an, some kind of irrevocable trust. I shouldn't say the final option. The final option for just marriage. To create an irrevocable trust. To transfer assets into that irrevocable trust, naming one or more of your children as trustee. As long as you do that, and retain the right to any income coming from that trust. If you transfer your house into that trust, retain the right to that income, and retain a so-called life estate in the house. You can keep living in the house, but as long as that transfer has been done for at least five years, if you need to go to a nursing home, the house is going to be safe. So that was an option that Mary had. Um, it is an option that and because when Mary transfers that house into an irrevocable trust, she keeps the right to the income or the right to a life estate for income tax purposes, that house is still hers. Even though for mass health purposes, it's not. It's like legal magic. You know, two agencies of the federal government that have got completely different sets of rules, and so you can kind of game the system uh, by having something that for tax purposes is still Mary's or is still yours and therefore when the house later gets sold there's still this step up in tax in, uh, in, uh, in or there's no capital gain but for mass health purposes once it's been gone for five years it's really gone so that's the irrevocable trust and that is a very very common mechanism for dealing with things next one. Um, but there was one other which we've talked about and that's really the, the, the reason why we're here. And I wanted to go through that progression so you can understand. This does not apply. Victor does, is, is of a lot, is of like no interest uh, if, your, if your husband or spouse has already died. Um, but remember, there was this other option that we talked about, which was if, if, if Frank and Mary are both still alive, and say Frank's not feeling well, and he, and, and he wants to make sure and the both of them want to make sure that if he dies, these assets will be safe. And they haven't done any advance planning, and they haven't transferred anything out of their name. So no five-year clock has been running. Well, one option that they can use is that, that so that, next slide. Um, oh, I'm sorry, go back to the previous one. You know, so Brenda changed the slides on me, and I didn't review them enough, and that's the way it goes. And that's the trouble with being a ventriloquist. You know? <laughs> One of the options that Frank had, that Frank and Mary had, 
would be to shift all of the assets to Frank and then have Frank change his will and say in his will, well, upon my death, uh, I want to leave everything not to Mary, which is typically what people have in their wills, right? But to somebody else, perhaps to my children, and that's one possibility, right? Or perhaps to an irrevocable trust, to one of the children as the trustee of an irrevocable trust, with the provisos that the, that the, that the trustees can use the money to take care of, of, uh, of Mary um, um, after I have died. And that um, was actually, is, is legitimate. You can do that. Uh, and then the assets that, are in, that, that end up getting placed into trust end up being protected. But there was a further thing that we often, I often talk to people about, which was to try to, once again, have it both ways. To try to structure things so that A, you're protecting assets from mass health, and B, you're avoiding having to go through probate. And one way to do that was to create uh, an irrevocable trust ahead of time. To create an irrevocable trust and to specify in that irrevocable trust that after somebody's death, all of the assets would pour into that irrevocable trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse. That was, and, in, and in doing that, you could kind of have a double benefit. You could put all your assets in trust, and therefore, or, or Frank could in this case, and therefore assure that upon his death, things wouldn't have to go through probate, right? But you also have this benefit that following Frank's death, all the assets were going to flow into this, into this trust, and therefore not be subject to mass health in the event that Mary eventually <coughs> needed it. Uh, and then came the Victor case. Uh, the Victor case was, as I mentioned, it was decided in the in Superior Court about a year ago. Uh, it was just upheld in the, um, in the appeals court on July 21, 2010. And in the Victor case, next slide. Uh, in, the Victor, in the Victor case, so let me tell you the story about Victor. Um, because you really can't kind of understand how this case might affect you or might affect your planning and might affect your existing trust. Uh, unless you've heard the story. So in 1981, uh, Mr. Victor, and that wasn't his first name, it's actually his last name. Mr. Victor um, apparently was not feeling well uh, and decided to do some asset planning together with his wife, Mrs. Victor. And so what they did was, they went into their lawyer and their lawyer prepared for them uh, a whole, a whole uh, uh, pile of documents, the standard pile though. They, he, he created a trust, the Victor Family Trust, uh, and the trust, in the trust, he named his daughter as the trustee of the trust. Uh, and in that trust, he said, um, if I die, I, Mr. Victor, or as long as I'm alive, as long as I, Mr. Victor, am alive, I have complete control over these assets. So it's completely, this trust is completely revocable as long as I live. Upon my death, I want all of my, all of these, all of the assets that are supposed to go into the trust um, to flow into the trust. And from then on in, the trustee, my daughter, is going to have complete discretion, complete discretion um, to provide funds from that trust for the benefit of my wife. Now, because this was a trust that was not created, um, that was supposedly created by will, it was supposedly the effect of this was that it was being created by will. It wasn't subject to the usual rules that if, the, if there's assets that are in trust, and that, the, that, that Mrs. Victor has the ability to get to, that therefore, they all have to be spent down for mass health purposes, right? So what he did was he set up this trust, specifying these rules, but he put like practically nothing into it. Um, he put in $10, uh, and oftentimes lawyers will tell you, you know, when you create a trust, in order to make sure that it is agreed later on that the trust was really valid, you have to fund it with something, and so, put in $10 or put in $100, and that's going to create the trust. Um, and then he said he was going to put into the trust certain life insurance policies so that upon his death, the proceeds from those life insurance policies would go into trust. So that's what he did, and he created that in 1981. And then he also had a new will drawn in 1981, and in that will he said, everything that I, everything that I own at the time of my death, I want to have go into this Victor Family Trust. So those were the kind of the rules. Next slide. And then these things happened. In 1983, just two years later, Mr. Victor died. 
So it was, he was apparently right that he wasn't doing too well. I would assume that also, that, well, I don't know what his, how old he was, but I would assume that Mrs. Victor was fairly young way back then um, because she kind of kept living. So this was 1983. In 1998, oh, so Mr. Victor died in 1983 and left everything, all of his assets to this trust. Then there was about $110,000 in assets. Uh, in 1998, um, there were actually some distributions made by the trustee, by this daughter, for the benefit of Mrs. Victor, who was at this point kind of living her life, you know, going along. So she received this total amount of money, about $39,000, went to Mrs. Victor. In 2006, 2006, so this is 25 or 23 years after Mr. Victor died, right? In 2006, uh, Mrs. Victor went into a nursing home. In 2007, she did this kind of dubious thing. She, she executed this, obviously, at this point, she went to a lawyer, and the lawyer was like, oh, we got to do something here. And she must have still had some assets. And so she executed a document in 2007 stating that those transfers that were made to her in 1998 and 1999 weren't really gifts. They were just loans. And so she wrote a check back um, to the trust for uh, $21,500 to repay some of those loans. $21,500, I would betcha, was almost exactly what was in her bank account at the time that she wrote that check, minus the $2,000, which you're allowed to have and qualify for Mass Health. She then uh, applied for Mass Health, and in 2008, uh, Mass Health denied her application. And the lawyer was, like, shocked, because he thought that, you know, all the rules here had been uh, complied with that all of the assets that went in that oh oh by the way in the course of that appeal next slide <coughs> oh go back to the previous one in the course of that appeal um, it, some of the testimony was well what about that ten dollars did you really get that ten dollars you know back in 1981 and she said yes I think I did I think I got the ten dollars. And then, and then one of the other question was, questions was, well, what about the life insurance policies? Were there ever any life insurance policies that were put into trust? And she said no. She said no. 